I'm also the IT person today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second just to go to YouTube. Doing a fantastic job, Megan. Love. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I say too. Um, Vince is, I think Vince went to the other meeting too. He's having sh trouble getting on. Is there any way you can send him another link as a panelist, or um, yeah, or maybe if he if he joins, Megan, are we're we live. Sure? We're live. Okay, thank you. I was just sending Vince the link, so hopefully he'll join us. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Calling the meeting to order at 8.05. Um, present, this is Deanna Diamore, the health director for the city. We have Terry Quell, Board of Health member, Janet Karpiak, Board of Health member, Ken Laleem, Board of Health member, Norman Weinberger, Board of Health member. We have Lamont Daniels, the Chief of, of Community Services for the city of Norwalk, and Megan DeMeglio from the Norwalk Health Department. And uh, we just have Vincent Amaruccio, who's joined us, who's also a Board of Health member. So our people. first, huh? Yes, I see. We have um, attendees from the public as well. Um, our first uh, order item on the agenda is approval of the July 28th, 2020 meeting minutes. Um, mm -hmm. So moved. Second. second. A second, Terry. Any comments? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any extensions? Okay, so moved. Thank you, everyone. Um, the second item on the agenda is public participation, and I believe we have a hand raised. Um, I did just allow them to talk if they'd like to speak. Okay. Di Diane, I believe you have your hand raised. Diane Lorcello, would you like to, to speak for public participation? Yes, good morning. I, I think I unmuted myself, but I'm not sure how this works. No, we can hear you. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Bold new world here. Uh, anyway, good morning, um, uh, Board of Health, and I see Lamond and other staff are on the call. Um, I just wanted to, in looking at your uh, agenda for today, I'm very interested, of course, in um, Health Director Diamore's uh, report as director, because I think health is, is and the department is one of the most important ones in the city, so I'm very interested. Uh, very early, I think overnight, I sent a Washington Post article that appeared, and there have been other articles discussing what happened at the CDC over the weekend related to COVID uh, and aerosols. And um, I just uh, wanted to come to this Board of Health to state that um, there is um, evidence that shows that the uh, indoor issues related to COVID droplets, uh, there's almost incontrovertible evidence that shows that in certain circumstances that the droplets um, aerosolize. They become smaller when people are singing, talking uh, at great, um, uh, you know, loudly or laughing, uh, if anyone is enthusiastic. Uh, and that material stays in the air. Uh, there is an MIT study that has uh, gotten out and talks about the fact that the uh, spread of aerosolized material or virus shed is uh, 26 feet indoors and that it hangs in the air for up to three hours, maybe more. That the, it's, there's another study, it's not the MIT study. Um, I believe that, uh, and I wanna tell you, I have perused our city website and of course, I haven't looked at every, every frame. I think that the city website for the health department about COVID 
does contain a lot of really good information. I do appreciate that there is a lot of information now about mask wearing, how to wear it, how to wash it. I want to tell you, I really appreciate that. The thing is, I do believe as a citizen that we are being censored by the federal, the administration and the CDC. So I wanted to put that on the record because I'm asking this Board of Health to take a look at the um, peer-reviewed scientific evidence about what happens to COVID droplets indoors and the issue of aerosols. And I believe it is such an important issue that there needs to be a public discussion in Norwalk about this. Uh, the public, not you all, we should get the choice as to whether we, number one, believe what the CDC is telling us based upon evidence that's the opposite on certain things, but also, um, I do not believe your hands are tied. If the CDC is providing false information, I believe this Board of Health, especially with a lot of you who have great, I, I respect you and I know that you have people in the business that could help back you up, but I don't think we need to just follow what the CDC is telling us. And I hope I don't hear that as the reason why this Board of Health in this city has not looked at the aerosol issue. So I come to you with grave concern as a, an activist, yes. As an environmental professional, I am. But also as a decent citizen speaking to decent other citizens. It is time that we have to do some of our own research to protect the public. On the issue of COVID, I again wanted to reprise what I stated last month about COVID fatigue. And um, I'm sure the staff has COVID fatigue in the health department, and I'm sure the mayor's office does, because you all have been uh, trying to you know, keep us informed as to how many deaths there were, how many hospitalizations. These are all very important. However, I do think we still need to have some teachable moments and some creative ways to let people know how to wear their masks. I don't think most of the public will go and, it, it, while I like what's in the CDC links that you have on the city website, I doubt very many people will delve as deeply as I did. I'm an investigator, I'm a researcher, so I will follow the trail. But I wondered if every so often the city could have some clever um, demonstrations, have the mayor don and doff his, his um, mask, um, have uh, Lamond or Deanna maybe be, you know, models and have the call a press conference. Please just, please don't rely just on Josh to come up with these things. He's not in the health business. We really need to take a look at these two issues. Um, I do uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting. Um, lastly, on personnel, I know that the city, as a cost-cutting measure, offered early retirement. Rumor has it that some will retire from this health department. Deanna, I am not sure the city personnel director is has been asked to do this, but I ask of you, please give them a hearty exit interview and try and save some of the institutional memory that these uh, fine staff holds because a lot of our future health depends on it. So I thank you very much for letting me speak. I look forward to having someone call me back about my two concerns, aerosols, COVID aerosol, and COVID fatigue, and finding ways to teach the public better about the health and safety issues and the PPE. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts and your, and your advice and, um, and being here with, with us this morning. Um, is there anybody else from the public who would wishes to speak? I don't see anybody wow. else who's their hand raised. Okay. All right, so the next item on, on the agenda is the director's report. Um, so I just wanted to give you some update about 
health department operations right now. Um, we started with appointment only clinical services on a limited basis um, this past month. So we've brought back our sexual health clinic um, as well as some of our tuberculosis services. And we're, we're starting to, um, well, we've been planning for flu for a while now. Um, and we're looking at some adult immunization as well. Um, but we've been really busy that the appointments have been booked. There's been a need for them. Um, so people have been coming. Um, Darlene put together really strict protocols for the operations of the clinics moving forward. Um, so it's been going, it's been going really well. Um, uh, we also, I wanted to give you an update, we have a part-time security guard that's now at the health department who's helping out at the front um, and helping with, you know, as we've opened the clinics and some other um, tasks for the health department. So that's been really great. And so I wanna thank Lamond for your assistance in getting us that added um, capacity at the health department and the mayor's office as well. Um, and our security guard is bilingual in English and Spanish. Um, that was really important to us moving forward, thinking about, you know, when WIC comes back in person and, and other services to have that, you know, English and Spanish. So that's been really great. Um, I also wanted to mention Teresa has been doing a lot with the Health Enhancement Communities Initiative. And um, I'm gonna ask her for a future board meeting to give us another update on the Health Enhancement Communities, but I just wanted to, um, let you know that's still going on. Um, still a lot of work has been done in that area. So um, if you're agreeable to it, I'd like to have her join a future meeting to give an update on, on that work. Um, so most of my other day, updates are going to be covered in the other um, agenda items. But does anybody have any questions about any of those items? You know, one, one, one question. Around the state, we're seeing um, <clears throat> health departments getting involved with their local uh, health uh, uh, entities, et cetera, and that, you know, with the combination of doing testing for COVID and immunization for flu, they were trying to combine the two that if you, you know, if you're setting up a pop-up site to do a lot of testing, can you include people getting also immunized at the same time? And so the clinical teams have looked at that and it's, it's very difficult to run different tracks and all the rest. So in many parts of the state, we're seeing a partnership between the community health center doing the, the COVID testing and the health department um, or regional uh, group uh, doing the um, immunization side. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you've seen an uptick from what you might've expected. Um, and it works a little bit different because of where the health, where the health department is, I mean, where the uh, health center is. Um, but I just wonder, that's what's going on around the state and I didn't know if you had felt it. So we've been having conversations with the community health centers about flu immunization. So the Norwalk Community Health Center has be begun doing their um, flu immunizations. AmeriCares has been doing immunizations. They have a partnership with Walgreens um, for their patients. And the Daystreet Community Health Center as well is doing that. Um, we're also working with the, the hospital to um, partner on a community flu clinic as well, you know, the city and health department and, and the hospital. So we are looking at that. Um, we haven't thought about really doing testing and flu shots at the exact same time. Um, so, but we sort of looked at it as two, as two separate, you know, yeah. things to accomplish and how are we going to accomplish that across the community? Thank you. Yeah, sh sure. Anything else related to the director's report? Um, so the next thing is the, the community flu clinic. So, so Glenn, Iana Cohen, our emergency preparedness coordinator, Teresa Argandesi, health educator, Darlene Hoffler, Megan DeMeglio, project coordinator. Um, a lot of the staff have been meeting Pat DiPietro to plan our um, our community flu clinic. We knew we had to do it and wanted to do it in a different way. And so we're doing our, our first ever drive-through uh, flu clinic. And we're doing or conducting it at Vets Park and it's gonna be in October, October 17th. It's gonna be a Saturday to make it convenient for people. Um, and we're actually doing the, the test of it. We're doing a setup drill like at, right now as we speak, it's beginning. It's, so um, we're doing that to, um, you know, to do our, our test run because, you know, we've never done this before in this way. Um, the many of the different city departments are helping us with getting everything set up. Um, so really thankful. It's been a great partnership. Um, and, 
you know, we're excited about doing this in this different way, um, in a, you know, in a safer way, you know, going out into the community or going, like, you know, in the past we've done churches, we've had a lot of clinics in the health department, just walk up, there's people gathering. So obviously we can't do it in that way. Um, we've been, Darlene Hoffler has been working with our, our electronic health record system to make, to change the way we do the the data collection and management. So we're we're aiming to make it as paperless and touchless as possible. We're going to have a link so people can pre-register beforehand. Um, Megan, do you want to talk about the postcard and some of that um, that's we've been working on? Yeah, so we developed um, a new postcard this year um, with, it's actually hybrid link, so we're probably going to be sharing that this week with the public. Um, but usually we print postcards out and we do mailings to um, all residents that attended our flu clinic in the past and then a few additional addresses that we have. Um, and so we have that. We also have, Deanna mentioned about um, our electronic medical records. We have um, iPads that we're going to be utilizing this year that we already had. Um, so we'll be just, when a per patient drives up, we'll just be opening their registration. Um, and um, pulling them up so all their health information will be already um, populated, their health insurance information. Um, and then so hopefully we won't be having to um, use our credit card machine, but we do have a mobile credit card machine that can be touchless. Um, it would just be like a tap. So we're trying to, you know, use all the technology that we have um, to make this, you know, as safe as we can for the public as well as our staff and volunteers. Oh, I'm muted. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. How many, how many people do you expect to be able to process in a day? We're thinking around 400, right? Yeah, so we've done some calculations. We've reached out to other local health departments that have done similar clinics. Um, it's a little different because we are doing insurance. So there's that extra piece where some, you know, some health departments, if you're just, um, you know, not charging for them, then maybe you could get a few more people in. But um, with that added step, we, you know, that is about what we're looking to do. And so it's going to be from 10 to 2 is when we're going to hold it on a Saturday. And we're going to have 12 okay. vaccinators, but six stations for vaccines. So, so are, we, are we charging the general public or only charging those that have insurance? That's my question. Yeah, we'll be charging, but if someone tells us they, they don't have the ability to pay, then we're not going to turn anybody away there. So um, I have a question about uh, the population that is um, uninsured and some undocumented, but at high risk for both of these things. Are we looking at any way to, to look at these folks? Absolutely. So that's, I, I alluded to our partnership with Norwalk Hospital. Um, so they're looking to, to offer vaccines for free to a population within the community. So we're working with them as well as AmeriCares, um, you know, they have their vaccination too, that's aimed at that population. So yes, we're, we're definitely thinking about them. And we're thinking about, um, we put in a request to the state health department for free vaccine. We haven't received it yet, but that would be the idea. The next round of this would be targeting those um, who, who you know, were able to get the vaccine for free. Anything else flu related? Um, I also wanted, an next item on the agenda is the water emergency. I just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, so uh, uh, Norwalk is served by two public, well, three, Aquarian as well, but it's a very, very small portion of the city. Um, but first taxing district, water department, and South Norwalk Electric and Water. And so we've been working really closely with them on messaging um, related to the water emergency, related, related to the drought that we're seeing. Um, the forecast isn't looking good for, for rain. Um, if you recall in 2016, the mayor declared a water emergency and he has done so again this past month. And what that enables him to do is to enact some measures for water conservation. And so we've adopted an irrigation schedule in the city that's consistent with what Aquarian is using for the other surrounding towns. So we're all consistent on a regional basis. 
um, but we continue to get updates from SNU and First Taxing District Water Department. We continue to look for creative ways to push conservation messaging, whether it's VMS boards throughout the city, the mayor's daily briefings, um, looking at social media posts, just trying to get um, whatever we can out there related to this. Um, I mean, unfortunately, with climate change, I think we're going to continue to see more things like this more frequently. It's not, you know, it's not going to be the rare occurrence. Um, so it's something we're faced with um, dealing with. And, you know, uh, one thing, um, one of the questions that, uh, you know, we get asked and, and we look at, you know, what what's the greatest use of, of water? And um, so we get updates about um, just really like limiting the non-essential uses, like watering the lawn and, and that. Um, and also this is like, you know, it's, it's really hard because we're so inundated with COVID response right now, but um, I wanna continue to look and partner with the different city agencies on, on ways we can address climate change and ways we can address, um, you know, thinking about water and thinking about, um, you know, like with a lot of the new construction in the city, there's a lot of infrastructure improvements related to that. Um, that actually reduce the water in, in, in those areas. So just thinking broad picture about all of that. Um, but so anything you can do to help us with the messaging about, about the water right now um, would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, so just wanted to, to give you an update on that and we continue to work with the water companies on that and the mayor's office and then our emergency management director as well. Any questions about that? Okay. We have, a, we have a system in place to monitor that. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's great to get it public. I think that's real important. Um, do we do we monitor in any way? Is uh, there the reservoir levels? Yeah. So um, both uh, both of the water departments monitor them and they give us updates. So yeah, maybe that's a good idea. We can provide those updates on where we are, and so if people can see it, like where our reservoir levels are. Then it, it'll resonate more with them. Yeah, also on the monitoring side, we actually, is there any, are there fines involved? What, what kind of oh, penalty? There are, so it's in, the, the water emergency is enforceable by um, the police department. And so there are fines related to if you aren't um, following the, um, like if you're found irrigating your lawn, if there's like a big offender, if they're monitoring, they can see like who are the greatest water users and try to figure out what's going on. And then they can, um, to put in a complaint to the city and then the police department has the ability to enforce fines related to that. Thanks. Yep. All right. And then um, we're also gonna give a COVID-19 update. So we continue to monitor the trends and what's going on in the community within the past couple of weeks, you know, across the state and Within Norwalk, we're seeing, you know, cases starting, there's starting to be the, this uptick, you know, for a while there was one new case a day, two new cases, and now we're starting to report four or five new cases a day. So we're definitely seeing that increase um, uh, within, within cases and we're monitoring them closely. We're seeing a lot of uh, cases that are associated with families. Um, so if one person's infected, then oftentimes we'll see multiple family members. Um, so we're, we continue to see that, you know, the close contacts, the full close family contacts of cases we're seeing. We continue to see that like we did, um, you know, at the, at the peak of this. Um, we've been doing a lot of work related to community resource coordination. So um, there's the, the state has set up dip for different regional leads for community resource coordinators. And we've been working with SWACA. They're the agency that's the community resource coordinators for region one. Um, so we've been meeting with them to talk about if someone is positive or if they're, you know, their case or their contact, if they have needs that they need in order to safely isolate or safely quarantine, you know, do they need, um, do they need food? Do they need diapers? Like th those types of needs. Um, how do we create a seamless system so that, you know, there's so many people that are calling, like there could be the healthcare provider calling with the results. There could be us, there could be someone from the state health department, 
there could be, you know, this community resource coordinator. So we really want that integration to be as seamless as possible. So we've been working with SWACA on that. We're also working with the Family and Children's Agency. Um, the Connecticut Health Foundation is funding community health workers across the state in certain cities, and they've um, funded funded them in Norwalk. And so we're, we're working really closely with the Family and Children's Agency. Lamond has helped us set up this partnership with them so that um, the community health workers um, they're getting onboarded now, and we're going to be thinking about how they can help us with contact tracing as well as just community outreach. And so one of the things, big things we want to look at right now is testing. Um, the state uh, really wants to, us to continue to increase testing within, um, you know, different neighborhoods, different populations. Um, and so we're, we've been looking, we think that, you know, community health workers who would be trusted members of the community being able to speak in the language, language more multiple languages um, will be really helpful for, the, for that outreach. So we're thinking of um, utilizing community health workers um, to do that, to help, help with that. Um, our staff continue to do contact tracing um, and Megan has been doing a really great job with working on onboarding volunteers. Um, so we continue, continue that effort. Um, but I mean, we're, we're really busy. We're getting lots of calls, you know, with guidance, continuing to want guidance um, on different situations and what people should be doing. So um, we continue to provide that. Um, and we also are doing a lot around enforcement. We're working really closely with the police department um, on enforcement. You might have seen that the governor um, put an additional executive order that puts fines to certain gatherings and to mask wearing. And so we're just trying to stay on top of that, but we've been doing a lot of the enforcement related to public health facilities. So we continue to be very busy. Um, oh, and the other thing I just want to mention is um, we're working with our, on a regional level on COVID-19 vaccination planning. Mm -hmm. And so the region is taking a look at, um, you know, like strike teams. They're creating this model where we can use medical reserve corps volunteers, emergency response team volunteers, and health department staff to um, look at uh, vaccinating first responders and the other critical care workers who are gonna be um, targeted within the first round of the vaccination. So we're really working as a region to, to think about COVID-19 vaccination. So I know I just kind of threw a lot out there, <laughs> um, but does anybody have any questions or discussion re related to, to COVID-19? Yeah, are, are there any restrictions in your grant from the, um, the, to put the community health workers to, you know, on the street? No, they, they want us to be able to do, to, to utilize the staff to, to do outreach in a safe way, but, yep. Um, I just wanna also just reflect on some of the comments by Diane, um, just to, to let her know, you know, we, we are all critical thinkers. And so, I mean, that's something that's part of public health is looking at evidence and the latest research and helping that guide decisions. And so um, just wanna mention that too, we're all critical thinkers and we're all looking at, um, you know, the latest findings and what's going on and how we can best really support our local Norwalk community. Um, you may recall when the CDC changed their testing guidance saying not requesting, not recommending testing for, for close context of cases, you know, the, the, the mayor's office and I, you know, we spoke about it and, you know, he has always been really wanting to follow the medical and the health experts related to this and he issued a statement related to that. And so he's been very supportive. So um, we continue to, to do that work as well. Anything else? Okay, Megan, you're on reaccreditation. Yes, so we have heard back from FAB. They changed um, things a little bit just because um, usually we would have been assigned a site, a site visit team of about um, two, probably one to two people for reaccreditation. Um, and um, now due to COVID, um, our team wasn't available because they're from another local health department. So uh, an accreditation specialist actually reviewed all of our documents. Um, and so that's the way FAB is moving forward. So they um, reopened a few um, measures and we're in the process of reviewing those. Um, 
a lot of measures that were reopened, it was just one piece. So I don't know if you guys remember back, but it was a lot of narrative writing. So you would have to write about an example, but you may have A through E to elements to touch on. So um, the measure might've been reopened, but it was just one element they wanted us to elaborate on. So it's not the full document or the full example. Um, so when we first opened, we were a little shocked, but then when I looked at it, it was really just like element E of one of the examples. So it was like, oh, okay, well we can, you know, elaborate a little bit more on that. So we have the team coming together um, this Thursday to review that. Me and Deanna have already reviewed um, the measures that were reopened. So we'll be, um, you know, working on reaccreditation during, you know, while we're doing the rest of everything, flu planning and COVID. Um, so we have um, about a month to respond or we can't ask for an extension due to COVID um, if we feel like we can't have everything together. We're really trying to push through. Um, and so this Thursday we'll be meeting with the rest of the staff and, and senior management team to kind of come up with a game plan. And we'll keep you guys updated um, next month on where our progress is. Um, but I'm excited to be working on something different than COVID. So I am excited to be working on reaccreditation. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Does anybody have any questions? I just want to add this new process that they've um, instituted. We're the first ones to go through it. So very Norwalk, yeah. like we're the first. So, <laughs> yeah, so they told us to let them know if this works, you know, if, if we need, you know, any, any suggestions that we have to them, they told us, so. All right, well, thank you, Megan. All right. Um, so the, the last item on the agenda is that for an executive session, I wanted to provide board members with a personnel update. So I'm um, uh, gonna remind you, I'd resent the link for the executive session. So we have to meeting and um, if we have any votes or anything really, any decision, like then we'll, we'll talk about that in the, the main meeting. But, all right, so do I have a motion to um, move into executive session? See Norman, do I have a second? Terry? Second. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll do that now. Um, and Megan, you'll you'll keep this open for us. Okay. I'm gonna leave the window um, during the session. Um, but we're ready to adjourn the meeting. No, there were no actions taken. So do we have a a motion to adjourn? A second? All right. All right, thank you everyone, have a good day. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.